Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for coming. We hope we might get some more people joining in a little while. Um, I'm Duncan Law. I'm the uh, Policy and Advocacy Manager for Community Energy England. I've been in post just over a year, but I was a founder member of uh, Brixton Energy and Repowering London uh, back in 2011. So it's like uh, coming home to my old activism, which is very nice. Um, we are also welcoming Daniel Cleland, who is uh, from the Energy Networks Association, and he's the Open Network Communications Manager, and uh, um, he'll be talking to us about uh, the future of energy as local, and uh, I hope how, how we can play a leading role in that. So um, the agenda will be me presenting uh, on the policy landscape uh, and looking for opportunities and directions that we as Community Energy and Community Energy England um, could be taking. Um, and then we will have a, a question and answer, which we will do um, facilitated on the screens. Um, so we will introduce hand signals and so on then. Um, during the question and answer, we will collect any uh, ideas you have for open discussion that we want to have after that, um, put it in a poll, and then we will uh, we will discuss as an open forum the the, the top three, or we will try to, uh, and maybe get beyond that if there if if there's will. Um, so. Uh, the aim for me is to start a dialogue about policy with our members and stimulate discussion and raise as many questions as answers because it has to be said we do not claim a monopoly of knowledge uh, at Community Energy England and uh, I'm hugely grateful to the many of you who have uh, made, alerted me to things, shared your knowledge, uh, given your opinions about what we should be doing. We want to know what you think and we want to get more contributions to Community Energy England's policy work and share the load a bit uh, and understand our priorities, how we should be influencing policy. We want to think big but pragmatic and we want to get members harnessing uh, every possible opportunity and harnessing the democratic process to move our agenda forward. So moving onwards, um, <laughs> policy for a thriving community energy future. Well, we've just published our 2030 vision, which shows what a thriving community energy future would look like. And it's quite, uh, quite ambitious. But um, so we're looking at the possibility of a 10 to 20 times larger sector. That is at least exponential growth. Um, powering 2.2 million homes, that's well more than twice the ambition that the original community energy strategy had for 2020, which of which we have so far only achieved 10% due to policy setbacks. And then lots of jobs, uh, lots of emissions saved and lots of money into especially local economies. And in the bottom right hand corner, it should be noted the just transition. So uh, the fact that um, we have to put equity and justice at the center of our work. And uh, yes, get democratization up there with the other three Ds. The, the numbers in the vision um, to some extent came from the uh, WPI Economics Report, The Future of Community Energy, commissioned by um, Scottish Power Energy Networks. Uh, and they urged the government to uh, not waste this amazing latent uh, resource and to uh, come up with a new community energy strategy, a call which was backed by uh, Nigel Cornwall in an excellent recent blog, um, which I can share if people are interested. Um, so where are we? Just a quick survey of recent history. You, you, you've all lived it, so you probably know it. Uh, 2018 was our worst year ever. Um, growth 
the, the sector was fundamentally stalled due to policy setbacks. 2019 was a year of activism and the climate emergencies and suddenly climate was back. Uh, we could have discussions with all and sundry about it. A community energy showed an uptick because of the end of the uh, uh, of the uh, feed-in tariff but of course that is a cloud rather than a silver lining and the business case is now uh, hugely difficult to make except in exceptional uh, buildings. We have the smart uh, export guarantee which is neither smart nor a guarantee uh, and mercifully Bayes acknowledges that and the Rural Community Energy Fund, which is suffering uh, practical problems at the moment, but at least is there. Ministers said the future of energy is local. Um, and Claire Perry uh, said that the community energy was a key cornerstone of the energy transition. But those are words and we still don't see much action. So we must take those words and try and make them concrete. 2020, we are under a Tory majority government, which has changed politics and changed our campaigning focus. We have to now face the Tory party much more than uh, we, we were before. Um, not that the opposition is no use, but uh, we just have to be getting the Tories on side if we want real change and probably the cabinet office and number 10. We had the feed in tariff extension and then COVID-19 changed the world but in my policy opportunities that is the overarching and probably the biggest because we have seen what an emergency looks like we've seen what emergency responses can be we've seen how amazing people and communities have been at stepping up and creating and delivering solutions and now we have to design the green recovery uh, and we must put people at the center of it in 2021, looking forward, we have the end of social uh, investment tax relief, and which isn't available to community energy anyway at the moment, uh, but we can't reform it if it doesn't exist. The end of RCEF, the end of the um, renewable heat incentive for non-domestic and an unprecedented recession. whoopee do. <laughs> so looking at policy opportunities out of that, as I said, COVID is huge, I think. Uh, and feeds through everything. Um, we have net zero by 2050, lots of local climate emergencies are aiming for 2030 to engage with that and show that 2030 is possible and that it's actually the, the only uh, one with outcomes that we want. The future of energy is local. The localization of energy, uh, as far as I can gather from discussions with Bayes, they acknowledge this, uh, but still nobody is quite knowing uh, how to do it and I hope Daniel will show us a pathway and and and, and uh, confound that assertion. Um, when Boris came in he promised colossal investments in infrastructure in science making the UK the greenest cleanest country on the planet but in all of that no mention of people or communities and that omission continues despite our lobbying. 9.2 billion unexpectedly for home energy efficiency. Uh, again, we need to make sure that that comes to communities and uh, comes locally rather than national agencies. The government's committed to onshore wind and solar, which we it was unexpected and amazing. But again, uh, only for larger than five megawatt projects, so leaves community energy out in the cold. That said, there was a great emphasis in the in the consultation on. Um, community engagement, support and benefit, but that only highlighted that community energy, who does all those things best, was uh, outside the support mechanism. So we have responded by uh, asking for a community energy CFD, which may not be absolutely what we want, but it's a way in uh, to discuss all the other things which I'll go into in more detail later that may be more suitable. We have the green recovery, build back better, words uh, heard in Boris's mouth. Of course, it's eminently hijackable, but we also have seen the importance of community and we need to remember that, help people remember that, uh, and make sure that uh, we uh, 
emphasize that that is emphasized in policy and that we continue to demonstrate best practice black lives matter has reinforced the importance of justice being at the center of what we do if if we if we don't if it is not equi if the success is not equitably shared then it will fall apart and anyway will it be worth having looking forward the energy white paper which was due out in june last year uh, is now scheduled for mid 2021 there's a treasury net zero review but it's been very difficult to find anything about it uh, the net zero plan which will probably be conflated with the recovery plan at bays a planning white paper to bring planning into the 21st century uh, which could be a good thing or could be awful and um, that'll be this autumn and then in november 2021 uh, COP26 and it would be great if we could go into COP26 alongside the government saying yes people and communities are fundamental to uh, uh, moving forward. Uh, so putting people at the heart of our energy system is not these strap line and mission it is our biggest and overarching policy ask. Um, to do that would be win-win-win and it's popular, 82% of people think the government should do more to support community energy. We will win by arguing the benefits we bring. So we need to be uh, getting better at doing the difficult task of working out exactly what those are, quantifying them, um, and arguing them. That's ongoing uh, work. We have the, um, the uh, social impact tool, which I hope everybody will be uh, using more and more. Um, we need people at the centre of the energy white paper, the net zero review, the, plan, the net zero plan and the COP26 20, and we need a new community energy strategy with people uh, at the heart. And one of the ways we will organize, uh, argue this is not just that we bring benefit uh, and we can decarbonize but that we are essential to the net zero carbon transition and it can't happen with us. And the Committee on Climate Change has observed that it will not be possible to get close to meeting a net zero target without engaging with people and that there is currently no plan to do that. So we need the cons consent and, and participation of people and community energy needs to interrogate itself as to whether we are doing that as well as we can. Are we doing our community outreach and advocacy and education uh, as well as we can? So that that is an undeniable truth. Uh, this is a quick survey, uh, which I can't see all of because <laughs> um, of the policy landscape. So because we have a majority conservative government, the cabinet office and number 10 uh, is very, very important. A lot of policy certainly new policy initiatives will come from uh, there. Very difficult to reach into. They will also be setting the tone and the agenda for the recovery. Uh, business energy and industrial strategy, we want a new community energy strategy from them, but probably won't get that by harking back to a coalition uh, golden age. Uh, so we need to find a way of uh, encouraging the um, the current incumbents, uh, Quasi Kwarteng, who I think is quite keen on us, uh, to own and originate it. We are thinking about the community energy revolution. Energy revolution is is a term that even uh, conservatives are, are happy to use. Support for community energy. Uh, I've mentioned the community energy CFD. We'll look at others a bit later. The energy white paper, the net zero recovery plan, and, and the localization of energy. Uh, other stuff, the Treasury um, is in control of tax relief, VAT on energy saving measures, um, which should be reduced to zero business rates, and obviously, probably in the autumn, a comprehensive spending review to work out how uh, the recovery plan will be funded. The Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government obviously runs planning, and they will be overseeing the white paper in the autumn on planning reform, and they could remove planning blocks to wind in England if they so choose. 
They also uh, can uh, input on how local government uh, will operate and how and procure and um, invest and uh, can um, encourage local local government to work with us more. Uh, the committees are active and good at the moment. I think Bayes is condu conducting a, a, a an inquiry into the uh, green recovery. Uh, with Ofgem, uh, we see that they have a decarbonisation plan, but still they don't see their role as um, encouraging through regulation the maximization of benefits through the through the energy transition and lastly our way into a, most of these uh, avenues is through our 268 community energy mps running swiftly through our uh, detailed policy asks the overarching asks as i've mentioned people and community at the heart of uh, energy and uh, net zero and, and recovery policy a new community energy strategy specifically with a community energy team at Bayes and cross departmental working group as operated back in the heyday with input from us. A commitment to local area energy planning and a core role for community energy in that and to fund energy efficiency as a frontline first uh, uh, item in the energy hierarchy activity again with a key role for community energy. Um, under finance and tax support, uh, Bayes controls the first uh, three, create a community energy CFD pot. That would be uh, a, a, if you want more details of that, there is an active campaigns page on our influence uh, tab of the website, uh, which explains uh, what we're asking for there. Uh, but it would be part of the established technologies pot to enable to fund a uh, sub five megawatt projects and it would set a separate uh, strike price. Um, we would still be competing against each other, but uh, we would uh, be able to get some guaranteed um, and certainty uh, on energy prices. Obviously much better than that would be um, uh, a really good uh, floor price, um, uh, a guarantee to purchase the electricity we export um, at a, a reasonable price. Um, we're still working on that. A urban community energy fund, obviously uh, the majority of people live in the urban areas. That's where much of the demand is. That's where most uh, population diversity sits. Uh, and at the moment it's out in the cold. Um, or alternatively, uh, maybe a national community energy fund with uh, urban rural um, dimensions. Uh, I look with envy at the um, Scottish CARES programme, uh, which does much more bespoke uh, support of community energy. Uh, we're asking for that too. A, a new grant programme to encourage local collaboration. Um, government seems uh, more willing to disperse or was more willing to disperse grants than to set up uh, complicated support schemes. Um, reinstate social investment tax relief for community energy. Uh, that's been a campaign going on for a year and a half now. And uh, the latest news is that they want to scrap the whole thing uh, in 2021. Um, reduce VAT, I've mentioned already. Uh, Planning and regulation, Ofgem should have social benefit in their official mandate. We have an agreement to a meeting with Jonathan Brearley, the CEO, but other things have intervened um, from driving that one forward. And then with MHCLG, reform the planning system to facilitate achieving net zero. We need that to be harmonized with the government uh, climate emergency ambitions. And, uh, to enable community renewables uh, in the process. And then obviously removing planning blocks to onshore wind uh, and ensuring a strong level of community ownership and control and benefit. We've asked for that to be mandatory in the um, CFD scheme. So how can we achieve 12 to 20 times uh, 
increase in, in scale. Well, uh, the reports all say with the right support, the original community uh, energy strategy said uh, with a following wind, we can't do this without support. So first of all, we have to get recognition for our case of benefit and indispensability. We have to be indispensable and then we have to lobby and get that support. Otherwise, we simply will not achieve that scaling. But I think there are things we can do within the sector um, and within our uh, spheres of influence and our local areas, which is forming uh, partnerships, um, working with community, with, with uh, local authorities, no matter how difficult that is, um, grasping opportunities uh, in the uh, evolution of energy um, locally, uh, demand side responses, obviously, uh, and that's been shown up by the um, change in energy demand during the emergency, is the, the other side of uh, a more renewable intermittent uh, energy supply system and design, d demand side uh, management the same. And uh, we must innovate, adapt, and diversify uh, and get more diversity in our sector and then we must plan um, to build capacity to scale. So where should we develop? Um, obviously urban areas, a big challenge but also a, a big opportunity. Lots of roofs um, and nobody else is doing them because they're difficult and not commercial. So we should do all possible rooftop solar. Um, we should focus on our people, do really good outreach and fuel poverty work and show uh, the huge social benefit. Um, South East London Community Energy uh, recently calculated uh, its social impact as a 24 to one return on investment on its energy efficiency work. Uh, that, that is startling and you're not getting that return anywhere else. We need to be pre preparing for building retrofit. Um, I think that's going to be a huge growth area and it's not something we're hugely engaged with. Um, EV charging, heat, partnerships with local authorities on climate emergency. There's a good deal of chaos there, but we need to be in there and, and helping uh, organize the chaos and taking a lead and taking a lead in local area energy planning, whatever that means. Um, and increase ambition, I think, too, yes. Um, so the sector challenges, which is kind of the, 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 the uh, counter, the, the flip side of that is how do we get heard and valued? And how do we uh, gather information about and argue our social benefit, which is key? How do we negotiate post-fit business models and diversify into new complex areas. Um, working with housing providers uh, should be a huge opportunity, but it is, will be difficult. Doing revenue stacking, at the moment there's no revenue in uh, most of those things, but we need to be there for when revenue is, uh, is um, findable. And then obviously the uh, growth areas, transport, heat, uh, store storage and then doing things difficult differently by supplying energy services building capacity to scale that's very difficult when you're struggling to stay alive but we need to be thinking about training thinking about uh, th thinking about building capacity to scale and doing community engagement working with local authorities I'm repeating myself so finally uh, a call to action um, please we need to harness our mps <laughs> that's our way and that's the way we will build critical mass change the center of gravity um the common sense in parliament uh, by having community energy people and communities heard and mentioned a lot uh in committees and the chamber and questions uh we need champions um the there is a climate coalition um, virtual lobby on the 30th of June. We're preparing a, a members briefing and possibly a, a, a very short PowerPoint presentation um, and that will be circulated soon. So please, if you haven't registered to um, meet with your MP on the 30th of 
June and we will supply you uh, useful uh, resources. Join the CEE Policy Working Group, which will be formed shortly, and the Lumio Practitioners Forum, where I have learned so much and, and got so much useful feedback. Um, and, the, uh, and we intend these workshops to be a regular feature, probably every couple of months uh, going forward, so please join those and tell us what you want us to concentrate on. I hope that will come out of the discussion later too. Help us get better at targeting our lobbying. So um, we discovered, for instance, recently that the, uh, uh, the minister at MHCLG has a rather wonderful uh, community wind turbine on his patch. Uh, so we will be harnessing that connection. Uh, also, MPs have been a gateway. The meeting, the picture of the meeting on the right there, uh, happened because we managed to get um, Annalise Dodds, now Shadow Chancellor, uh, who's a friend of Community Energy, to ask a question, ask for a meeting, uh, and that has transformed our relationships with uh, the, the, energy, the Energy Minister. We need to ask more parliamentary questions, uh, written as well as oral. We need help with local and regional advocacy. Uh, a lot of this presentation has been very government focused because uh, coming into the job, I, I was conscious that without support, without central government support, we couldn't progress. So that's been my big focus, but equally uh, local and regional, if the energy system is to localize, is going to be a huge part of our advocacy. And uh, that in many ways is best uh, to come from local partners. Um, being central to climate emergency plans and COVID recovery plans and doing local area energy planning. That's the third time I've said that. Uh, I'm getting near the end. Uh, only 35% of people have heard of net zero. So how are they going to be um, uh, engaged in achieving it? Uh, and we can be out there um, getting people participating, even if they don't actually care about um, uh, the policy and then lastly as you have done so brilliantly on many occasions share your expertise and your data it is really valuable that is what got us the feed-in tariff extension the ability to get the required data to uh, the officers at bays uh, within 24 hours so finally uh, thank you for listening there uh, is my email address uh, and our Twitter um, handle and a uh, few useful links. Uh, we have an influence page on the website with uh, a section on how to make community energy um, central to government thinking and how to engage your MP. Uh, current consultations, uh, our record of policy submissions and briefings, um, our active campaigns, a new page, and the link to the Lumio Practitioners Forum is at the top of the active campaigns page. And then also lots of uh, um, signposting information about uh, climate emergency. Our parliamentary briefing is at that short link uh, and summarizes um, all of our asks and has a two or three page argument as to why community energy is indispensable and should be supported. So please do use it. Feel free to send it to your MP when you write to them. And um, uh, that's me. Uh, I, would, I will now unshare my screen and let Daniel take over and then we will do question and answer afterwards. Thank you for listening. Um, thanks Duncan. I'm just trying to share my screen quickly. It's the first time I've done it with my iPad. So let's see. Um, can you guys see the presentation? No, not yet. No, we can't. Yeah. That's okay. Um, 
Cool. Um, so yes, as uh, Duncan said earlier, uh, my name is Dan Cullend. I'm the Communications Manager um, for ENA's uh, Open Networks project. Um, Duncan has asked me to come along um, to present on uh, local area energy planning and the DSO, uh, DNO DSO transformation, which is all stuff that um, is being taken forward either through uh, our Open Networks project uh, or through uh, the innovation team uh, here at ENA. So if we could just go on to next slide there. Um, so just a quick intro to uh, the Open Networks project, which I think is the vehicle that's sort of taking most of what ENA does in this space forward. Um, it's a major industry initiative that is bringing us to um, sort of a more smarter grid uh, where we can have um, electric electricity flowing in multiple directions, um, providing energy back to, providing clean energy back to the grid um, and helping uh, reach our net zero targets. Um, and it's doing this through opening up uh, local markets um, to build an all-inclusive energy system. Um, this leads to lower cost to uh, bill payers. Um, the, the commitments in our flexibility commitment and some of the work that we're doing uh, on key management specifically um, will help uh, get flexibility or, or resources connected to the network um, as fast as possible. Uh, and hopefully reduce the need for costly reinforcement. We're working with uh, Ofgem and Bayes. They're very much um, a part of everything that Open Networks does. They sit through uh, all work streams um, and sit on the steering group as well, so provide great strategic uh, direction for the project. Um, and we're really driving some of the standardization um, in, the, uh, in the transition. Um, that Ofgem and then Bayes are really keen to see from the project. Uh, and we're learning by doing, we're not just waiting for things to happen, we're, we're taking things forward through uh, innovation funding and trials to test different aspects uh, of, of what's going on in the transition. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please, Duncan. Great, um, so I'm not gonna spend too long on this slide. This is more just a, uh, an illustration of, of what we're trying to achieve, uh, moving from this kind of linear uh, um, energy system, uh, sort of in the middle of the screen to the more smarter um, and flexible energy system where we can get uh, more community projects uh, connected to the grid and, and providing these flexibility services to help us uh, decarbonize uh, and reach net zero as quickly as possible. So if we could just uh, move on there again, Duncan. Um, just quickly on some of the benefits, uh, opening up these markets, uh, these local flexibility markets, um, like I said earlier, uh, will, will reduce bills for, for customers by reducing the need for reinforcement, um, but also allow businesses um, to take advantage of some of these, uh, to, to some of their um, low carbon technologies that are, that are being um, introduced on uh, office spaces and, and uh, those kind of things. Um, or across the country um, and the whole systems aspect uh, to the project um, is key looking to um, create efficiencies between gas and electricity um, and trying to decarbonize heat and transport to the, the hardest decarbonized sectors um, and data is a, a really key part of uh, of the whole systems work stream um, providing visibility of where we can do these things uh, and hopefully um, bring benefits to, to customers so if we go to the next one. Uh, so local area energy planning. Um, local area plans are driven by local authorities uh, and your local DNA will be part of the energy planning uh, for your area. Um, ENA isn't directly involved in local planning, um, but it does support uh, the planning process by driving consistency among its members. Um, and as I mentioned uh, earlier, the, the whole systems work stream, work stream four of open networks, um, includes representatives of local authorities. Um, so they're really looking at how we can plan um, the whole system's efficiencies from that perspective. Uh, and these things can be translated uh, down to a local level and feed into to local uh, plans. 
Um, Duncan mentioned earlier that uh, Claire Perry, I think uh, Chris Skidmore, when he was uh, covering for, for Claire, um, mentioned that the future of energy is local um, and open networks is really taking this forward, um, looking to design networks that enable local community groups to, to, to connect and to sell energy back to the grid, uh, really making it as dynamic as possible um, to increase opportunity. Uh, and our flexibility commitment that we released last year details how we're um, how the networks are going to implement this uh, and the principles that they're going to adhere to. So level playing fields, um, access to data, transparent reporting. So there is clear, um, sort of a clear trail um, that everyone can access uh, right from the beginning where we identify the opportunities to the end where we report on the results and, and the methodology used to, um, to determine who was connected. Um, so there are six steps there that um, can be accessed uh, on our website. If we could go to the next one, please, Duncan. Um, so the digital systems map is something that is being uh, driven forward through um, our data working group. Uh, and this is something that is going to be a, uh, a great help in the future um, for local area uh, energy planning. Um, it's all of the data that we have in a, a standardized format um, that really sort of highlights um, opportunities or, or constraints and, and where things can be addressed. Um, so we have a video that we published uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, sort of demonstrating how this will work in the future. Um, I think it's probably one of our best viewed videos with about, I think it's over about 650 now. Um, and quite a positive response on the direction that we're taking. Um, I'm not sure exactly when uh, the map will be uh, released, but I think it will be later this year. We're just, I think, considering some GDPR implications um, at the moment, but the team are very, very keen uh, on hearing feedback from wherever they can. So if you have any, uh, have any views or if you want to watch the video and have any views on that then please do um, send it in. We could move to the next one please. Um, so how community groups uh, can get involved. Um, so as I said earlier, um, oh sorry we've gone back to skip the slide. Um, yeah uh, quickly on the, uh, the the transition to DSO. Um, so Open Networks kicked off this work in 2017, um, looking to define what distribution system operation is um, and what functions and activities would be associated with that. Um, we then took that work uh, through a consultation uh, in 2018, uh, and then last year we consulted on an impact assessment that um, sort of took the five worlds that we had identified to get to DSA uh, and analysed them against over 30 uh, criteria which included uh, cost to consumer uh, and uh, decarbonisation. Um, and the next step of this work is due to be released next Tuesday, um, if everything goes to plan and we get sign off this week. Uh, and it's an interactive DSO implementation plan that will really highlight how uh, networks are getting to DSO, provide a bit more transparency uh, on the steps they're taking, the milestones, um, particularly around sort of business planning and, and as we move into to ED2. Um, they've been working with uh, consultants, DNVGL, uh, to capture these short, medium and long-term actions. Um, and further to this, which will be quite complementary, I think, is the uh, updates to the Conflicts of Interest and Unintended Consequences Tracker that tracks uh, all of the potential blockers to reaching DSO. Um, who these people, uh, so who the organisations or, or the mitigating actions sit with uh, and how we can address them. And then on to the final slide, which is how you guys can get involved. Yep, so as I said earlier, um, local energy planning is undertaken at the local level and the DNOs have uh, specific uh, stakeholder engagement programmes that feed into that process. Um, but from an open networks and ENA point of view, um, last year we did a few roundtables in the summer specifically for um, community groups, the sort of small intimate sessions that touched on a range of things that open networks cover and some things that don't but could also feed into ENA's work. 
Um, so this year we decided to host these formally. And we've got three round tables that are currently being planned. Um, we're kicking off um, the planning this Friday, so hopefully we'll be able to send uh, some invites out shortly. Um, but we're trying to time these into key moments into the into the project so consultations or when we have big releases coming out uh, that we really want uh, people's input in um, and these are really the vehicle that open networks uh, will use to to get community groups involved into the project um, last year a lot of the feedback went straight back into open networks or, or into the wider ENA innovation program and it, it did um, change a, a few things um, from the project's uh, point of view. So that was really, really good. Um, and yeah, just to, to join our mailing list, um, as I said at the bottom there, there's the link to subscribe. Um, keep up to date with events, uh, publications, consultations, anything that goes on. Um, it would be really, really great if you guys could, uh, to, could join that and be a part of Open Networks uh, moving forward. Thanks, Duncan. Thanks, Daniel. That's great. Um, so we will undertake to uh, circulate notice of those um, forums and the links to the videos and the mailing list um, in a newsletter soon. Very perfect. Um, Dan has very kindly agreed to stay for uh, Q&A. Um, but we'll shoot off for the open discussion. Uh, I think I can just about see everybody um, now, except that most people haven't got their cameras going. Um, we will do the Q&A in uh, groups of three questions. Um, and uh, if I bring up the chat as well, um, then uh, if anybody can't get their uh, video going, um, yes, please, would you put your cameras back on? Because we'll do this by hand signals if we can. Uh, if anybody can't, please tell us and uh, we will um, try and keep a, an eye on the chat as well. Um, oh, the chat has just taken over my computer. Brilliant. Um, alternatively, if you're not getting noticed, please just pipe up. Um, does anybody want to kick off with a question? I've got a question uh, about whether we should be focusing more at national government or local government going forward. What a good question. <laughs> Yeah. Anybody else got another question they want to ask? Amanda. Sorry, forgot to unmute. Um, there was a point somewhere which said you're working with, or it, we should be working with housing providers, which should be a huge opportunity. I'd be interested to know a bit more, like more about that, because I'm uh, I live near a proposed garden village, and I'm involved with trying to uh, meet with the developers and ensure that there's photovoltaics on the rooftops, whether it's community or individually owned. And so, yeah, be interested to hear more an expansion of that topic. I'll try. <laughs> Third question. There's a question from Sydney in the chat um, asking what proportion of decision makers does Daniel think understand the localization of distribution? And uh, Pete had his hand up as well, so. I was just wondering in your, uh, the policy discussion, there was um, presentation, you didn't mention grid capacity 
um, and that feels to me like a major challenge and uh, I think it would be good to think about how we can address that in partnership with others. Uh, flexible grid connections, for example, going beyond active network management, looking at integration of demand, demand side issues into trading of capacity, all those sorts of things need testing and trialing and it would be great to see community groups actively involved in that because of the strong local dimension um, and the targeted charging review off gems targeted charging review we're protect that's another major challenge and uh, loss of embedded benefits um, and maybe even balancing charges um, but hopefully not um, I'm not quite sure what we can do about that other than just really keep on top of it and understand the potential impact that that's going to have on our projects uh, and, and future business model, but on a, from a lobbying point of view, it would be good to try and throw our voice behind at least not including uh, charges, even if they're just kind of going to stick with taking away the benefits. Oh, and sorry, the last thing, kind of, the, what? How can we make more use of the local energy contact group? And um, I mean, we should have a. A route to Bayes with that, um, but it's not met for I don't know 12 months, if not more, 18 months. Doesn't imply that Kwasi Kwarteng is is particularly engaged, but maybe it's the civil servants that have not engaged him. If it, maybe if we engaged him directly and said, make more use of this, this is a way of engaging with the sector. Um, he might put more pressure on civil servants to organise it. Didn't it meet in February? Uh, um, God, is it, have, I, have I forgotten a meeting so quick? <laughs> I think it did meet in February and we did request that the Minister take notice of it and we did note that a number of people from the local energy team and, and, and I think you actually said can um, Community Energy put a, a line into the white paper and they yeah. asked us, well, no, yeah. they but we submitted a line and we've been chasing it ever since. We, I guess, sorry, you, you're right, um, memory fades so quickly, um, but Kwasi Kwarteng hasn't been at the no. meeting. We haven't had a minister for a ministerial advisory group um, for 12 to 18 months, since Claire Perry, in fact. Right, we'll, we'll get on that, um, we'll get on that. Brilliant, thank you. Um, good questions. Uh, Is somebody playing a beautiful guitar? <laughs> um, uh, Dan, do you want to uh, speak about the um, local decision makers understanding localization? Sure, yeah. Um, so from the conversations we've had with uh, MPs um, and sort of special advisors, uh, we've got a few contacts. Uh, in the special advisor's office um, uh, and some officials as well. Um, those conversations have been positive. Um, for specific details, I'd have to take that back internally because uh, it's uh, a couple of guys in our public affairs team that have dealt with all of those meetings. Um, but especially the, the officials from Bayes and Offgen that we have uh, working on open networks, they very much um, understand what's going on, the, the transition to um, sort of a more localized system. Um, but I can take that question back inside and, and get back to, to Sydney um, with more specifics if that's helpful. That would be brilliant. Um, and any thoughts on how we should be interacting with local decision makers to encourage them in the benefits of getting involved in local area energy planning, because it feels quite niche. I, I, I've never heard energy mentioned in the context of local plans at all. There's a climate change section and there's a building section, and the, but there doesn't seem to be an energy section. There doesn't seem to be an engagement with local authorities and the supply of power. It's a bit like food. They, our local authority turned around and said, well, there's Tesco's next door. Until this, em this emergency came up uh, and yeah. we 
you've been headbutting them about Brexit for months, that they actually realised that they had a responsibility to be engaging at a policy level and a practical level with with that. And I think the same, you know, should apply to to energy. So how do we lever them into the into the room? Yeah, um, definitely. I think the, the again, some of the conversations we've had, the the net zero stuff has sort of given local authorities um, sort of more of a it's kind of pushed them to, to, to sort of see this as, as more urgent, which is great. Um, and they are, the, we're having some positive conversations um, with local authorities. So it is it's still on their radar. Um, in terms of engagement, I think I'd have to back that down to back to the, D, uh, the, the Pacific DNOs, um, just because they are way more involved in the process um, than ENA is itself. We're just sort of driving standardization between uh, members and try and make it uh, as more efficient as possible um, but I think it is it is certainly something that's that's fast coming on people's radars and who are you talking to in local authorities so we we know we it's a local uh, it's a local government association we've got some links in there that have been uh, quite useful um, in getting some of our, our, our materials out Okay. Um, yeah. And anything more specific? I mean, do do local authorities have energy officers? No, they probably have somebody who deals with their own energy portfolio. But yeah, um, I think that's. I can't speak for for all local authorities because they all have uh, sort of different portfolio holders and, and cabinet members. Um, but I think the local government association, they're the ones to I think to start these conversations off with um, just because they have links to, um, to counsellors and to, to officers and they've been really useful for us. I don't know how much more detail I can provide. But. Okay. If you could provide us with a link with the person you cooperate there with, we can, we can explore with them how we, sure. can, we can support. Um, yep, I can definitely do that. Thank you. Um, uh, do, do you have any feelings about um, lobbying at national or local level? Um, I mean, most of the lobbying that, that we do at ENA is national, um, and we have um, we have quite a good relationship with Alan Whitehead, um, who I think quite gets what we're doing um, and has some of his own views on, and, and sort of the new Labour leadership team have their own views on on where they want to see energy going. Um, differs, I think, quite a bit to the Tories. Um, I don't think we've had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with uh, with Kwasi Kwarteng yet, um, but I think this whole COVID disruption sort of derailed that. I think much similar as you guys, um, but I yeah, most of our lobbying has been um, national, and we're hearing some good things um, in terms of sort of transition and where they want to go. Uh, I think we were. With the white paper, we hosted um, quite a good policy workshop that involved Bayes and Ofgem last year, um, so that we could feed into that. Now, obviously, that's been delayed, um, but I think we're going to start ramping up our, our lobbying in those areas um, shortly. And lastly, but I'm delaying my contribution. <laughs> um, any any response to Pete's um, perception that we need to move flexibility forward? Um, urgently and rather than just uh, and use that to solve grid capacity um, issues sure yeah um, I'm no expert on this so um, I can again something I can take back inside but flexibility is, is sort of a, a really key area for open networks um, I think I mentioned briefly but we have a, a huge consultation coming up uh, that starts I think late July um, sort of running for, for eight weeks um, that will cut across everything we're doing uh, on flexibility um, so that's the sort of the recently released common contract for procurement um, a and versus network reinforcement procurement processes uh, I think they've got seven products in total that we'll be um, consulting on so it's a huge area for, for open networks um, and I think that is sort of the, the recent um, 
demand and uh, network issues around that has really sort of put in everyone's head in the project how important that this consultation is and and that's why we're timing um, our community energy forums to, to fit in with this consultation period so that we can really get a good community voice um, in those responses. Thank you and, and at the moment uh, you know we, we're all excited about flexibility but there's there's no money in it uh, to to fund us investing in it other than a few trial um, sort of sandbag sand, sand, sandbox um, uh, projects. Um, when do you think flexibility will be properly valued such that uh, it, it can be that a market can develop oh gosh uh i don't think that's a question that i can answer um, i'd have to take that back to randall but i can definitely get an answer uh for you on that one um brilliant uh, okay so now now i have to start i have to step up <laughs> <laughs> um paul thank you really nubby question there um my focus has, as I said, has been much more on national, although I'm very, very involved and engaged locally in the local climate emergency and um, in, uh, to a lesser extent, in, in the work that repowering is doing. Um, my feeling is that uh, if we can find the right buttons, the right pressure points, we can get change. Uh, quite signal change at the stroke of a pen from a person at the top. Um, to some extent that's endorsing the sort of hierarchical and uh, uh, system, so I, I have problems with that. But, but uh, if, we, if our growth is dependent on uh, centralised government support, at least for the next few years, then we have to try and change minds to get that. Um, you know, uh, and we need to be present in the policy directives, the song sheets from which uh, all the officers and the politicians to a large extent will uh, sing from. Um, and if we, if we miss that boat, we, we could be kind of mixing metaphors, be out in the cold and, you know, just forgotten. Oh, you're not in the industrial strategy. So, uh, well, we've got enough to work on. So we'll come to you when the next iteration puts you in it. Um, so I feel that's a justification for our national focus, but equally if we are localizing the energy system and our power base and our influence base is local, we absolutely mustn't, we, we must be operating on that. So much of the infrastructure delivery stuff actually happens apart from mostly energy systems um, happens locally. So it's really powerful to do that. Um, I personally can't engage with 400 councils uh, and um, I don't have the local context to do it. I, I can, if I know what it would be useful to supply, help to supply some of the, the information that local groups can then use to take to their local councils to convene council discussions with the, the DNO, uh, with local energy users who might want to come up with innovative solutions. Um, in Herne Hill, near where I am, there's uh, new shops being proposed or being converted, and and the the uh, the network's response was, well, you haven't got enough power, so you need an extra substation, and the only place to put that is in one of the shops. So we've lost a shop, um, and we, with repowering and the local uh, forum, argued and argued that this was a stupid way to go and that they should be, try and be innovative and do load sharing and storage and renewable generation. Sadly, it's just gone through planning because there's nothing uh, in planning law that enables a committee to say no to it. But we have opened up a, a sizable local dialogue. Um, and we, you know, I, th I think that's, we, we can, we can change the zeitgeist by, by tacking, uh, tackling, outcroppings of nonsense and supporting a good practice locally such that um, the, the good practice becomes famous and copied um, and uh, the people who are making the decisions suddenly see that as the way to go and, and an opportunity to be known to be on the side of right. Um, Paul do you have any comeback on that? Uh, what are your feelings? Yeah I mean 
I think I think it was mentioned somewhere in your presentation um, that uh, you know the government is looking to the regions to sort of formulate their own um, plans for, for for net zero or transition. Um, certainly, where I'm in Bristol, uh, the, the 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 city council here is is sort of moving forward in its own way to net zero uh, through the, the the Bristol City Leap, and they're bringing community into that. Uh, that program uh, through procurement. So I don't know if everyone's aware of the idea, but City Leap is a partnership, a JV between the City Council and a yet to be um, uh, yet to be found technology and finance partner. But the council are using that procurement process uh, and the social value aspect of that um, procurement process to, to really bring communities in. Um, and this is a, something I'm involved with, which I guess is why I'm bringing it up. Um, but what we've done in, in Bristol is form a, like a coalition of local community energy practitioners or agents, whatever you like, people who've actually done stuff on the ground uh, and we've come together and we're, we're presenting a, a basic, what is essentially the, the Urban Community Energy Fund to the bidders and saying, look, tack, tack, tack us onto your bid and we will deliver social value for you. So just, just as an example, but it, you know, the, the reason why that's become possible um, and, and why the bidders are really interested in, and the council as well, uh, is is because the council has put social value so strongly into that into that uh, procurement process. So I, I understand lots of local authorities, and you're only probably one person working on it, Duncan. But uh, I don't know if there's a, an association of local authorities. But you know, is there a way that local authorities can um, put into their procurement this this idea of social value and get community energy into it? Um, yeah, that's brilliant. We all watch Bristol. They do amazing things. Um, and that question about harnessing social value, I think is really important. I'm not an expert on this. I do know um, uh, that one of your colleagues from Bristol, whose name momentarily escapes me, is, we're working with Lee um, on... Uh, sort of on benefit from community energy and he knows his way around the uh, treasury green book um which is very strong on social value um and it may be able to help us um argue that social value should be a bigger part of the decision making obviously it's been there for a number of years but um even in the treasury i think it's not not fully internalized um so any help you can be on that and if there's a, a sort of best practice guide that you would see your way to writing a short uh, one on on your experience with the coalition of local practitioners and the work you're doing there that would be hugely useful and we would do everything we can to disseminate it um Duncan. it must be a way forward yeah so um could i just comment um, on that, on the thing about social value. I just uh, wanted to support what Paul's saying. I, I just think it's really vital and um, has benef could be have benefits elsewhere. So the whole discussion around p power purchase agreements and um, securing long-term agreements with local authorities with social value integrated into them so those PPAs are at a, above market value and above market rates and justifiably so because of the social value could be a game changer in terms of getting subsidy free renewables off at a small scale uh, for community energy groups and there's there is work going on again in bristol um, but also in devon i think uh, with jake um, bernier and devon councils um, uh, and plymouth um, and so um, I, I just think it'd be good to draw those together. And that's the sort of role that we could see could play, kind of drawing together those various discussions and, and then disseminating that learning around social value. Just think it so, could be so important. Apologies, I'm just um, making food while we speak, which is where I've kind of <laughs> moved. And I'm, and I'm putting and myself off, off video. <laughs> um, um, no, just, before, just before you go, Duncan, can I just in case people haven't seen a couple of people in the chat have mentioned um, a social value act um, Helen said that that was supposed to basically do what we've been talking about for local authorities and 
um, I presume it's Karen of Karen and Rod Rodney who has said uh, in Northern Ireland social enterprise NI has been lobbying for a social value act for three to four years. So um, I don't know if that's part of this equation. Um, I, I don't know anything about that myself, but just to add that in. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. I would, if, if I could just add before that, there was a good question from Chris, which links into this. As part of the engagement plans, any thoughts on how we can engage representatives of vulnerable groups to make sure they're not left behind? And this is part of the social value, uh, a specific example. And uh, yeah, how do we include these people rather than speak for them, I think, is the thrust of that question. Yeah, brilliant. Um, just on the Social Value Act, um, uh, I met the ex-Labour politician who put that through, um, and it, apparently it is social, you, you, you are mandated to take account, no, you are mandated to consider social value. Uh, she is uh, trying to promote uh, a, um, the, a a new um, social value act, which says you are mandated to take account of, which means that you actually have to put it into your uh, quantitative calculations around decision making on uh, contracting or uh, PPAs, which would be a, a huge advance if it was mandated to be considered, mandated to be accounted for. Um, this is great. We will try and draw this together. Um, it seems to me that that MHCLG, one thing they could do is to mandate local authorities to to take account of social value in their um, uh, awarding of contracts and PPAs. And uh, if we've got evidence, we can then take it to um, to MH to to Robert uh, Jenrick and say this should be happening and look it's already in the uh, HMT green book you should catch up and make sure that it's in uh, everybody's decision making process that's under your jurisdiction and um, we'll put that in the Lee in in the benefits discussion um, that we're having can you make a note of that um, thank you that that's that's brilliant um, this is the kind of discussion I really wanted. I learned loads. Um, coming back to the questions quickly. Um, oh, by the way, if there are um, uh, topics that are not coming up, uh, you can either raise them in a question and we'll discuss them as we have done now or um, stick them in the chat. Um, and we were going to do a poll, uh, but I think we can probably just do it by discussing what we want to talk about. Uh, back to the questions. Um, Amanda, uh, uh, I'll do... Pete's as best I can because it, it's um, brain stretching for me. I'm afraid TCR is still a little bit uh, beyond my uh, ken. Um, I think uh, your point about um, not getting uh, lumbered with charges, even if we do lose embedded benefits, is taken. And uh, we will, if you could help us to um, make sure that point is heard. That would be uh, great. Um, and yes, also uh, lobbying for um, a better use of the um, local energy contact group. Uh, can we talk about that offline uh, afterwards? And we will we, we will do a little to make sure that it meets again soon and that the minister is there. Um, do we need to, Pete, is there anything more we need to talk about? about uh, else have anything they want to uh, contribute on that subject sorry uh, i missed what you said then duncan um you you kind of it jammed up you, you were asking a question um uh, is there any more we need to talk to and uh, flexibility? You mentioned um, partnership. Uh, could you? Don't you might need to have another go at that. Am I breaking up or something? Yeah. 
I did it again. Ah, uh, hang on, I'm going to open a heavy glass door in case that. improves my connectivity um just saying i have um said everything just about everything i uh, can say about um targeted charging review and uh, about um the trade-off between grid capacity and uh, flexibility but um pete you mentioned partnerships as being uh, possibly part of the solution i think would you like to expand on that um, uh, in terms of grid capacity, I, I was just, uh, I guess, making the point that there are a lot of discussions around at the DNO level around investment over the next uh, period, and and trying to uh, ensure that um, we get the capacity for for local generation, uh, and and we get uh, some proper balance between all the gas peaking plants that are soaking up a lot of grid capacity. Um, in our area at least, and, uh, and I believe in other areas, um, th there's no kind of, uh, there's this approach of being, let's be agnostic about the technology that's getting um, connected, which clearly is, 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 is working against <coughs> a lot of the zero carbon stuff. So there feels to me like a real issue there about getting uh, access to the grid, to a small part of the grid, and then there's an issue about increasing the grid capacity and making more, getting more uh, capacity available um, through uh, improvements uh, and making sure that that's prioritised, uh, which is a much bigger issue, I, I appreciate. Um, but the more that DNOs get input from their local authorities about their plans and from lo local communities around their plans, then hopefully that, that would at least influence uh, their future thoughts. Well, I appreciate it. It's um, not a particularly strong angle. Um, Do you think some kind of mandate that they should uh, consider um, connections to the grid in terms of carbon impact? So if there's a competition between a gas peaking plant and uh, a, a solar um, array with battery, um, they should, uh, they should be mandated to connect lower carbon thing first this technology um, neutrality is 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 a blight i agree uh, i think it would be really good to get people who've got real expertise uh, around the grid and we have them uh, some of them in in within ce's ambit to kind of just think about how we would go about doing because it. it's more complex than just carbon clearly the gas peaking plants are generating flexibility on the grid as well and we need to be able to um, find alternative approaches to that as well. So you can't just look at it on carbon, I appreciate, but not having any view on carbon does seem to be uh, counterproductive. But there are people we could talk about. So talk to about Helen, maybe you, you can help with this as well. And um, uh, it goes beyond my knowledge and experience to get real good quality advice as to how we can affect this. But I think we do need to find it. Okay, note taken there. Um, I just ask a question about one way. I think there was two issues in Pete's comment. One was around um, applications for connections to the grid, which um, are dealt with through the connections um, method or charging methodology and uh, DNOs have to deal with them. They all, they all deal with them the same and they have to deal with them following industry agreed um, a methodology and um, they're dealt with as they as the applications are received by the DNO so you in terms of the order they're submitted so you wouldn't really be in a situation where you had to pick either or because you have to deal with them sequentially in terms of um, the flexibility stuff and whether you can value carbon reduction um, I was going to ask Daniel is that going to be one of the questions in the open network consultation that is coming out because at the moment that's part of how uh, DNOs consider flexibility as an option as opposed to network enforcement which is how the two options which is what we have to do at the moment we have to consider what's the best value for customer is it um, actual reinforcement or is it a flexible solution and within the procurement of that flexible solution there's a cost benefit analysis we follow that um, doesn't value carbon savings 
at the moment to be, enable us to be other, anything other than technology agnostic but I don't know if that's a question that's coming out through the consultation Daniel. Um, I haven't seen the consultation paper yet I'm not sure if, if Jason has finished drafting it but it's I think because it's in an early stage I can take it back to him um, and I can I can see if that's something that we can include or at least have the discussion um, but I, I haven't seen the, the draft consultation paper yet so I'm not quite sure. Just just an idea, but could social value also be applied to this? We we did try and open up that discussion with Ofgem saying, you know, if they had a maximization of social benefit in their remit, then then the, the logical the logical concomitant of that would be that if there was a uh, queue jamming, uh, then somebody who could show uh, social value could could queue jump a, a developer who's just sitting on a, a, a an allocation. Um, I believe in Holland or s somewhere recently where I've heard about uh, developments on community energy, the, the community energy has priority access to the grid, uh, priority connection rights. Um, I could, I could find that out, pin that down. Uh, certainly that would be best practice that we would like to see here. Um, I mean, it's always the case, isn't it? Um, with, with the way policy is set up, or usually the case that, um, you know, bigger, bigger wins, um, bigger companies, bigger organizations, better resourced organizations wins and the small, you know, bottom feeders like us don't, don't get the chance. So that there needs to be some way of leveling the, the playing field. Yeah. And in, um, just to go back to the comment about local authorities is that um, plans for investment across the local authority area um, are taken into consideration by DNOs in their forecasting and therefore what network capacity may be required. Obviously a level of certainty needs to be put on those plans because plans don't necessarily always come to fruition but DNOs do speak to the local authorities in their areas and other people that are responsible for um, developing new infrastructure to make sure that the, um, they can be accommodated in the forecasting plans that feed into and inform the strategic investments that go up into developing the networks. So, so Helen, is there anything that could be done to improve that communication? Um, Probably, because as you've all highlighted, speaking to local authorities isn't easy. Yeah. Uh, I can only speak for our personal experience. We only operate in one license area, so it's not something we have a lot of resources for either. Um, so we probably don't do it as well as we might want to if we had um, more time and money to put on it. Um, but um, I don't. I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Pete, but I'm sure it's something that can be improved as many areas can be. Is there some kind of obligation for um, the DNO to look at uh, developments that are in planning to, to take a, account or is it an obligation on the developer to contact the DNO and say we're planning uh, industrial estate or a high rise and we will need X connection? Um, this is the edge of my detailed understanding but DNOs as of last year have to produce um, future forecasts for how they think the network um, the capacity demands on the network will change over the future and one input to that is definitely um, investment plans across their area they're also um, a statutory consultee on um, local when local authorities produce their local area plans they'll be a statutory consultee in terms of individual projects, we will find out about them when the customer submits either a budget quote or an actual quote for connection. And that is when we do the network study to see whether there is any reinforcement capacity required for that individual project. The point of talking to local authorities is to try and have a slightly more longer term view and use our um, strategic investment plans to um, best effect. And will you be talking to somebody in the planning department? Will there be an expert in the planning department? It will depend on the local authority who we talk to. Uh, there's never a standard answer. I know, no, no, sorry. Um, I think there's, um, there's, there's two sides of this. The DNOs look at their strategic plans for a particular area based on what the local authority plans might be in a, in a, um, a local draft plan. And then when, when a development is brought forward the developer then has to contact the dno 
to get secure a connection quote which that that's the process so the the dnos try and um anticipate where development might take place and um perhaps look at strategic changes in the future but the cost of connecting to individual developments will be quoted for as part of a uh, specific development cost and i think when you look at um community uh, proposals for um, generation then one way the dnos could perhaps um, be helpful would be to subsidize the cost of connection for some for some community schemes and you know i've been involved on every different side of uh, connecting to the grid and you know there's always a problem with the cost of grid connection to big or small schemes you know having looked at small individual turbines or quite large large schemes there's always this big check how much you have to pay to get the connection and that can be even for a small uh, solar project so that's my suggestion that you actually look at encouraging the dnos to subsidize the capital cost of connecting their particular proposal we're discussing um, with our sustainability panel, which advises and um, helps inform our business plan development proposals to support community and local energy in the next price control period, which would be from 2023. And one of the um, proposals is, um, is a version of that. So there's two aspects to a grid connection cross cost. There's an extension assets, i.e. the bit you need to get your project to the grid. And then there's any uh, reinforcement that's triggered as part of that. And at the moment, a community group would pay their proportion of the reinforcement cost as well as the connections um, the extension assets and we're proposing that potentially the um, well, one of the proposals that we're discussing is potentially that the reinforcement triggered would be socialized i.e all customers would pay for it but um, depending on what the outcome of the targeted charging review that may or may not be required anyway because if the targeted charging review moves towards shallow connection costs then that charge might be re removed for all types of customers anyway so there's quite a lot of issues around that and it's just one of the ideas that we put forward and we're currently gathering views on that to see whether it's something that goes forward I, I, could sorry pete i was just going to add uh, i mean i think it, uh, that, that would be a wonderful idea and um, one of the things that we've talked about um with WPD without any success so far has been uh, around whether they can uh, spread cost. So rather than looking at the cost that you do pay all up front, whether they could be spread over the, the lifetime of the asset. Um, if th they could be subsidized as well, that would be even better, of course. But even if it was just looking at spreading the cost would have value. Um, to what extent may, may I ask a quick question, which is yes, probably yes. a very stupid one, but if, for example, looking at a new housing development, if there's also a solar farm, so you're, you've got an increase in demand, but you've also got a, an increase in supply. Okay, I think I know the answer to my own question there. <laughs> I was going to say, does it mean that you avoid the reinforcement charge? But now I'm thinking, okay, at night time when the sun's not shining, you still need all that extra capacity because you've just got extra demand. Is that, uh... um, I think so. And also it's not just about the, the draw of energy. It's about voltage stabilization, harmonics. And that's now I'm just okay. making stuff up, but I'm not making stuff up. I don't understand, but it's, it's not, it's, it, there's other considerations that you need to take into account. <laughs> right. But sorry, just quickly, not... I'm going to have to drop off now. Yeah, uh, I've got another corner to drop onto. Daniel's not local grid. Joining us. That was brilliant. And um, we will touch base uh, and carry on. Yes, of course. I'll send over um, some stuff uh, on some of the questions that you guys asked. Um, Thank you. Uh, and then stuff about the roundtables as well. That's really important to us. So yeah. we'll hopefully get that around to everyone. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you so Great. much. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Cheers. Um, th this this uh, discussion could could swallow all the time until lunch um, and i wonder i think we should open up to a couple of other things but note that this is a hugely complicated and there are a few people who have expertise and we should be connecting with them and i wonder whether this is 
the subject of another forum among those of us who care to engage um, in maybe a couple of months time maybe first one after the summer um, so Helen can bring back any um, new thinking from uh, your um, your uh, um, advisory group and uh, we can try and get an expert along and, and decide where we take it from there um, did anybody have a last comment they wanted to make uh, that was a yes please from Pete good okay that's duly, <laughs> duly noted um, thank you just coming back to one question um, which Amanda asked about housing providers and her garden village um, I don't have a lot of expertise on this but I do have some connections because with um, uh, housing associations and housing associations are looking at a huge retrofit challenge uh, literally having to upgrade in some cases two uh, dwellings a day before 2010 uh, 2020 uh, 2030 um, just uh, amazing uh, and uh, uh, one local to us um, catalyst who happens to be a, a a member happens to be a board member of Transition Town Brixton, which I'm part of, uh, is very interested in uh, engaging uh, with community energy so that retrofit, um, particularly tech retrofit uh, on um, his housing stock can be, uh, the community can help fund and own, including the community that uh, is part of his housing association and, and lives beneath it. Um, it's at right at the very early sort of first one page proposal stage, but um, I have connections with sustainability officers in a number of housing associations, all of whom I think would be very open to contacts from their um, local community energy groups. So maybe that is something we should provide a little bit of resource around uh, and encourage groups to open up discussions with uh, with their local um, social housing providers at least. As to engaging with developers, I think um, I think that I'm much less experienced in that. Um, Lee wants to say something. Yes, do you? No, you're just sticking up. I was going to say something. I think um, from the point of view of developers, they will be looking at um, how they sell their, their development. So they will want um, to make sure that there's a reliable, fundable, uh, source of energy for their properties that they sell so particularly residential units so um, in terms of um, someone borrowing money to buy a house or whatever th there needs to be a reliable uh, source of energy for that house otherwise it won't be mortgageable and I think that is a challenge which I've seen looked at you know when when, when um, companies are looking at um, uh, I suppose community uh, energy projects, um, ESOs and whatever, it's, it, it is difficult for developers um, to go down that route because of that, that issue of, of, of um, selling the properties beyond the, their development. To have a, um, basically a, um, a property which will secure a, a mortgage um, offer. I, mean, I, don't, I don't think I think it's I think things are moving in the right direction, but it, it it's a it's a big it's a leap of faith. Yeah. I, I feel that um, if the mortgage lenders sort of recognise this is a, you know, this is a viable, a, a reliable project, they could perhaps convince that would perhaps convince the developers to take the risk. Or but but I yeah, don't. Know. Right, it's, it's it's how you get there because um, you know. Anyone buying a property wants to know that their their energy is reliable. It's it's not going to, you know, it's been produced by someone who's going to continue to produce it. It's at um, an, an efficient, uh, it's efficient, efficiently supplied to the property, and it's uh, cost effective as well. So if but if can... the if the opinion of community energy projects is that they do not fulfil those requirements then we've got a big problem <laughs> with the image well we've got to make the case that's the point isn't it yeah. we've got to make the case that um, community energy is as good as any other energy and then the electricity 
companies, I mean, I don't know which, which uh, player in that whole group would, would be the ones who could say, yes, we have confidence in these local. Well, in some respects, that's, that is um, where there's a good case. I've been thinking about this quite, quite a bit, really, and it's um, that perhaps a part, you know, a much stronger partnership with the DNOs, um, you know, who, who do provide the electricity, but through the community groups, maybe that's 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 a, um, a way that should be taken forward and explored much more. I think it's interesting. Uh, we we're talking about supply side. We're talking about energy generation, and the biggest energy use of a house is space heat. And the biggest cause of the need for space heat is energy waste through the fabric. And what we need to be doing is engaging with developers and making a case to them of why fabric first building up to the best possibly sta possible standards is actually not expensive it's an investment they will increasingly now be able to sell them at a higher premium if it's social housing the local authority or the housing provider will get more rent the local authority will get more rates if the the social housing resident is spending a smaller proportion of their uh, income wasting heat through the walls but this is the argument this is, the arg this is the argument we've been trying to make, but we just keep coming up against the developers' perception that uh, fabric first is not, is, is not going to be viable. Um, and I was just wondering if there was any more ammunition, knowing that I'm going into another meeting with the developer on Friday. <laughs> I don't know if you've come across the London uh, Energy yeah, yeah. Transformation Initiative. They, they've produced yeah. a very good um, design for net zero guide uh, yeah i have I'm, I'm aware of the letty guide yeah yeah i think that's the best resource out there at the moment and we, we've referred to that in our in our communications with the developer at, at great length but uh, the other thing I, I feel is that your developers are going to work according to their spreadsheets which has which embeds their wisdom uh, and that um you may have more traction uh, changing the the zeitgeist in the local authority. There are already local, well, there are already developers doing um, doing uh, passive house, but few and far between. But there are local authorities. Exeter, for instance, is only building passive house from now on, and they're building it on economic grounds. Uh, mm. Ealing is going to be moving in that direction, you know, and and that is. If you could get a local authority to internalize the argument for fabric first and uh, really top notch uh, energy efficient development in their own practice, it feels like whilst you can't legally change what the what the developer is mandated to do, you, you're on a better footing f to argue that uh, the local plan should stretch as far as it can stretch. And of course, we need to campaign for uh the, the not, not the st the standardization in in the future home standard doesn't take place because then there's no leveling up possible it's just leveling to the lowest common denominator um do you have any any anybody got any thoughts or or follow on to that i, I think um garden villages and new communities are a great opportunity to um, work with local authorities to impose a design code as part of the planning conditions, which then that design code can um, embrace all sorts of different issues, such as efficiency of um, building construction. And that, that, that perhaps is um, a way in which the local authority can help um, put, push it all down that route. Um, the, I mean, it, I've, I've had involvement in community, um, new communities where a design code is part of um, the fabric of how the, the scheme is developed. So the initial developer will require any areas sold off as subplots to conform to those design codes. So it's getting the design code right to include the elements relating to energy efficiency and energy use that can um, help in that. There was a, you may remember Gordon Brown's Eco Towns. 
of which I think only one was ever built. Um, but the the design, the, the planning constraints on those were really good practice. Um, and that might be worth looking at. I know the Town and Country Planning Association uh, may also be able to help you on that. They're really quite a radical bunch of people who are interested in sustainable development and have led on it for many, many, many years. There's another concept which you may not have come across called energy islands. Um, um, Chris Cook, uh, who's worked in with community energy in Scotland, is working on Sark, which is obviously an island, um, on developing a trading um, relationship and uh, an ability for a, a tech community to be um, to be relatively energy independent and, and that's stretching at the bounds of my knowledge but I could look into it and if it's relevant uh, send you some uh, a connection and uh, some information. Um, does anybody else have anything more to add to help arm Amanda to <laughs> go forward in her positive campaign? What about what do people think about um, our engagement with local authorities being on best practice around their own developments because that is something obviously that they have control of and they can with our input um, change their spreadsheets so that social value and uh, you know things like getting rent and rates back is part of their calculation rather than just uh, oh god this is going to cost a 10 percent premium on our build cost is that a productive area for us to uh, to to help try and resource community energy groups around Good idea from Pete. Thank you. <laughs> there was a thumbs up from Paul if you missed that. I did, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, well, that was four questions, which has taken us until quarter to one. Um, There's been I think a couple in the chat about COP. Don't consider if you've got time, I, it, would, it would be good to talk about what you're seeing ahead or planning for that. Okay. Um, I'm finding to... Okay, uh, opportunities of COP. Um, uh, yes, thank you. Um, we have been part of a discussion earlier this year with ResCoop about coordinating a Europe-wide community energy presence at COP. Um, sadly, that's not gone forward because COP hasn't gone forward, but the, but the group is still convened and uh, will reconvene um, in due course. Uh, they have observer status and we have applied for observer status. We won't uh, know whether we've got it until probably early next year, I should think. But either way, uh, we have a way of convening um, events in the secure zone and it feels to me like the most productive avenue to pursue would be to do this not as a fringe group not as a, a lone voice um, shouting in the wilderness but to try and get the government to see this as an opportunity for demonstrating uh, policy leadership and best practice in their practice so we have a double leverage you need to up your practice around community and uh, embedding people and community in your policy. And then we can shout about it to the world. Um, so uh, that's, that's as far as the thinking goes at the moment. Um, can I come in there, Duncan? Please, Sydney. <laughs> Only that. Um, I have it on good authority that the nationally determined contributions still need to be submitted by December 2020, regardless of when of COP is. That came from the chairwoman of the Petersburg Dialogue. And I had corresponded with Fiona Harvey of The Guardian, who looked into it and confirmed that she also believes that that is the case. Now, I haven't heard anything from government that they're busy putting together our nationally determined contribution. We still have the EU one. We don't even have a UK one. But as president of the COP and Assuming that this is correct, it needs to be submitted by December. Really, um, Alok Sharma needs to 
put together a very ambitious one which needs to align with what the government is going to come out on its new infrastructure plans, etc. very, very soon. I mean, is that a good button to, to, to press? Absolutely brilliant. This is why I employ all of you people. <laughs> Thank you. That's fantastic. Um, yes, and that would be a, a great parliamentary question to get some information out in the open about that. Um, but I think we need to be ready to, uh, with resource to put pressure on it to go in the right direction. So I'm sure they will be working on it. There will be somebody who is employed to focus on our NDCs. Um, but yes, I have no knowledge about what's happening there. So it would be good to try and find out. Um, if you have any thoughts about the best way of taking that forward, please do input. I'm happy to have a chat with you offline, uh, Sydney, and, and to work with you on okay. that. I will just say Alan Whitehead has asked, well, pre-COVID, and when the COP was still this year, uh, when are they doing their NDCs? And they prevaricated. So I have actually written to Alan Whitehead about this, but he's probably less likely to act on it from me than from maybe from CUE. So yeah, we can talk about it separately. Well, we, we if I could come in there, just I would say I like that point on the NDCs during December with what the Climate Change Commission said about getting people on board so that the government doesn't say, oh, we need to do it quickly, uh, let's go big. We bring it back down to community energy by saying you need people on board. Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, Emma was on a round table with Alan and Ed Miliband and uh, Matthew Pennycook, um, who is Celsius MP, uh, looking at the green recovery uh, recently, and they are act actively soliciting us for input, um, particularly around um, uh, project failures due to uh, legislative blocks or a lack of support or other conditions so if anybody knows of projects that have uh, founded or, or or failed please uh, send us details of that but that is an open door that we can uh, talk to them about um, about this as a as a useful lever thank think, you um, on that I think planning is a major problem for many uh, energy projects and, I, and if you want to put the point to simplify the planning process for community uh, energy projects that would be um, that should be recognized that a community benefit uh, should be put into the planning judgment for those sort of projects so they should weigh in, um, in favor of such schemes being supported Approved. Sorry to butt in again, Duncan, but can I mention this um, Bim Afalami thing about planning? Just, I'll just read his, his vision that I think maybe it um, says what the government is doing on it. He's come out with a unlock, oh, a trans, transformative policy for Britain after coronavirus, and he's published it. And number five is use a streamlined planning process for a much greater range and size of infrastructure. This will make the majority of infrastructure built in the UK much faster, cheaper and easier to build. This will help the levelling up agenda be delivered quickly. Well, I don't really like the sound of it <laughs> because usually uh, making planning uh, quicker usually means, you know, allow you to put up rubbish. Uh, but that seems to be the way the government is thinking. Maybe that could be realigned to something useful. I think that's very important. Um, we have ongoing work around the, the with possible and a, uh, a baroness around um, the onshore wind, but also focusing on uh, the energy white paper because uh, making planning fit for the 21st century can be exactly what you describe, uh, but that is incompatible with uh, a recovery um, that is driving towards net zero and um, I, I think that's a very good uh, reason to redesign 
the danger is that they would dismantle all the, the sub clauses that define what sustainable development means, hugely arguable, but, uh, and, and there's nothing there, but a, a, um, a, a, the, if the purpose of planning was to achieve net zero as soon as possible, rather than something amorphous like sustainable development, um, then, then uh, if something isn't contributing to meeting net zero, then it's uh, seriously disadvantaged in the planning process. I don't know what chances are of getting that, but um, various planning heads I've spoken to are, are interested in that as a concept. Um, but I, I, I agree, we need to keep a watching watchful eye on this otherwise it will all be liberalized and uh, be a free-for-all um anybody got any other comments on planning was that your response um eddie to the to the to the blocks that are threatening yes um, it was it was okay. uh, it, it's it's a happy I mean, there are two sides to this planning shouldn't be too liberal but it should also be um a process which is uh definable at the start you know where you if, if you start and go down the proper route you know where you're going to end up and at the moment that isn't off, often the case yeah there's another pitfall um for community energy um evidenced by the uh, supreme court decision around the seven uh, the seven seven dale turbine uh, which ruled uh the local planning permission uh invalid because the planning permission cited a community benefit fund and this was deemed to be buying planning permission despite the fact that uh, bringing a local benefit is a is a material consideration under planning so uh, it's really that's really difficult to negotiate um, and the message from the Supreme Court judge was that it's been a that's been that's been an issue for very many years where, where developers of whatever nature put a community fund yes. that is disregarded in the, in the, in the planning and, decision uh, process. It has to be disregarded, but it should be taken account of. It should be seen as a positive benefit. And that is where perhaps some lobbying could be put forward to, to change that assumption. We argued in the CFD uh, consultation that if uh, a community benefit fund of a certain proportion per megawatt hour capacity uh, was mandatory to get uh, a CFD, then that would level the playing field because uh, there would be a presumption of a community energy fund um, and therefore it wouldn't have to be uh, an additional as assessment criteria that's a potential uh, pitfall. Uh, but the other, th the other message from the Supreme Court judge was that the that uh, that the Bay Secretary of State should be clearer in what they want out of renewable energy projects and particularly community renewable energy projects. And if um, you know community benefit was uh, a, 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 a an important policy aim, then uh, that that would be could become a material planning consideration. But if anybody's got any. Uh, expertise to help us negotiate through this morass in in dealing with mhclg around um uh, future planning regs then please you know step up and and tell us you've got it I, I, i'm not <coughs> going to volunteer because i don't have specialist expertise i was going to suggest kathy smythe who used to be on the board and uh, does um sees board does and has dealt with this issue in the past and been around it several times uh, in trying to create greater room within the planning system. Uh, I just add though, that if we look at community benefit, um, just purely in terms of the, the community fund, we're gonna always fall into this kind of pit hole because there is, as Eddie says, kind of direct comparison to what developers have done um, to time immemorial and kind of in attempts to buy planning. And, uh, and so it's kind of understandable if we promote a community benefit fund, that planners might think we're just trying to do the same thing. Whereas actual community benefit is of course much wider than that. And we need to be a lot stronger perhaps on this whole social value thing and, uh, and defining uh, it far more wider than just the benefit fund. Or well, finding a way to, to make the community led or community owned part of it, the bit that's different to a exactly. private, private yeah. developer and somehow get that as part of it. But um, Thank you. If, if, I, if I may, um, there's, Paul's mentioned in the, 
in the chat about um, CFDs, and since you've already sort of slightly started talking about it, I just wondered if you might do five minutes on it. Paul, did you have a particular question? Yeah, just just before I, I go that, just just to just to say that the Scottish government, because um, planning's devolved, uh, they've I think they've got something up there about uh, community ownership uh, in the planning in planning policies. So it might be worth checking out what they're up to. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if we've got time for this, but because <laughs> it's it's quite a big subject. But uh, community CFDs, um, I'm just. Yeah, I just see I just see certain pitfalls in that. Um, the main one being that you know if if, if we're all in competition with each other, uh, and you're, you know you've you've got a a five megawatt limit on on the CFD, you're always just going to get larger projects, and it um, it sort of selects against smaller projects, which might be worthwhile and might be worth doing for for, for other reasons. Um, so yeah, just 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 to sort of point that out, really. I don't know whether that can be overcome with with bands like they used to do with the fit, or or even you know, I mean, we had a we had a little discussion on this with our Northern Ireland group, and somebody came up with the idea of of, of maybe having like the Rock some sort of obligation on energy suppliers to buy community energy, and whether that's that's a better idea. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, we, we are cognizant of all those threats and, and the idea of competition uh, among community energy uh, in a race to the bottom is not palatable. Um, the banding is not doable as banding, but the way that the low carbon uh, contracts company said we could possibly get a carve out, as they call it, or a minimum, um, uh, allocation of the, 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 the CFD pot, which isn't going to be huge, I don't think, um, to community energy would be to, to stipulate a capacity uh, allocation, which would be bid separately on by community energy. And within that minimum, it might be possible to have, let's say, uh, a gigawatt hour capacity for um, uh, three to five megawatt plants, another gigawatt hour capacity uh, biddable by um, one to three and another uh, segment of that um, allocation uh, sub one megawatt um, so that there isn't, you know, it isn't two or three or four uh, five megawatt projects that mop up all the allocation. Um, that would have to be uh, evolved in discussion and if you would be interested in being part of that if we get any kind of um, meeting or interest um, we will be gathering more points of view and expertise to go into that uh, negotiation um, the idea at the moment is if you if you, you if you have that that minimum um, and you set an administrative strike price above which uh, bays will not pay um, and so people are aiming to uh, bid below it. So one big project bids 20% below it, and then a slightly smaller project bids 15% below it. Uh, they get it next, then somebody else bids 12% um, uh, below, they get it. So it, it wouldn't, unless there were a number of big projects that all bid at 20% below and mopped up all the funding, there is a possibility for more expensive projects to come in later on on the um the auction process it's still not ideal um i'd like to see an administrative strike price set at the at band levels and that's what that's what community energy gets if it's if it's um if it's uh, but that's not going to happen that was the first round of cfds and now it's a a market instrument and they're not going to move from that um but any expertise uh or willingness to, to engage gratefully received. We did have great input from members um, prior to making the submission. Just uh, unless there are any last points or uh, I think we haven't got time for more questions. It is now the witching hour of lunch. Um, if anybody wants to flag up uh, agenda items for future um, gatherings, we've got one around um, uh, local uh, grid connection and engaging with DNOs um, 
and some work around uh, the NDCs. But if anybody wants to flag up other um, uh, issues to discuss, P put PPAs, um, please do add them and we will put them in our pot and or our pipe and uh, eventually we will discuss them. Anybody got any others? Counting down to lunch. <laughs> and just while people have a minute doing that, do you, just to remind you to plug the, uh, the extension extension consultation. Oh, yes, thank you. Um, on our current consultations page, uh, there are a number of extent, uh, consultations led with the uh, feed-in tariff extension consultation, which has two questions, one around uh, a proposal for a 12-month extension for hydro and another around whether the um, the six-month extension for uh, um, projects that were due to complete by the end of March uh, is enough. Uh, feedback I've had so far is that uh, people need more, a lot of people need more, some up to 18 um, months uh, for for really big projects, but please do feed into us initially um, and we want to collate all the information on behalf of the sector um, yeah that's well, it yeah also also it's very important for our relationship with Bayes that particular one to to gather that input ourselves so it will make a significant contribution to our future advocacy work to to be the people that are um, representing the sector on that particular point yeah thanks well said yeah um it, this is not uh this is not a, a cut off you you don't have to hold your peace you can always email us with suggestions for the 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 um policy discussions or open a discussion on the lumio practitioner forum and uh, if it generates a lot of interest then um and isn't concluded then maybe that would become a a, a future topic for discussion um thank you all for amazing input and and long may it be ongoing uh, and all power to our elbows our collective elbows um, let's bring pressure wherever it is productive to bring pressure and do that in uh, collaboration uh, with justice at the center of all we do <clears throat> um, brilliant thank you very much and uh, speak again soon don't hesitate to email me d.law at communityenergy.england.org. Good afternoon. <laughs>